Good morning. I am your host, Elisa Howard. I am a public health educator and consultant and owner of Minority Health Consultants. You are listening to Public Health Just the Facts. With this show, we want to set the record straight for Southern Nevadans as it relates to all things public health. This show is sponsored and brought to you by the Southern Nevada Health District. For more information about the Southern Nevada Health District, please visit them at southernnevadahealthdistrict.org. We have a great show and guests for you today. I don't like that. We have a great show and lineup of guests for you all today. On today's show, we're going to discuss mental health in the African-American community. We will talk with Dr. Sheldon Jacobs and CEO of One Million Madly Motivated Moms, Tansy McNulty. Finally, we will provide you with some current local updates to protect, protect your family through our arm in arm against COVID-19 updates. So let's jump in. I have some of my favorite people here with me today, Dr. Sheldon Jacobs and Tansy McNulty, here to chat with me about mental health in the African-American community and share some resources and other information with those of you tuned in. Dr. Jacobs, let's begin with you. Can you please give a brief introduction about who you are and the work you do within the community? Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, and first off, thank you for having me on. Uh, I think this is tremendous what you guys are doing, so, so thank you. Um, so uh, just a quick background. Uh, I, I recently opened up my own pri- private practice uh, in 2010, I mean, 2020, sorry, uh, Dr. Sheldon Jacobs uh, Counseling Services. Uh, I also am the Vice President of NAMI Southern Nevada, and also do some work for uh, the Las Vegas Raiders. Can you tell us a little bit more about what NAMI is? Yeah, so NAMI stands for the National Alliance of Mental Illness, and and we offer a a wide variety of uh, support groups that are free of charge. Uh, um, And a lot of our support groups, you know, they focus on educating uh, families, educating individuals about uh, mental health, um, as well as we're also a advocacy, um, you know, uh, organization. So we do a lot of advocacy work and we like to have boots on the ground and really trying to advocate for mental health and so that folks receive the best uh, services and supports uh, possible. That's amazing. And I have so many questions for you. But first, let's bring in our good sister, Tansy McNulty, to this table as well and to this conversation. <clears throat> that way, this can be a free flowing conversation between all of us. Uh, Tansy, can you please give a brief introduction about who you are and the work you do within your organization? My pleasure. First, uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for allowing me to um, to sit on this panel and just have a conversation with you all today. Thank you for accepting. Absolutely. <laughs> so my name is Tansy. It's uh, Tansy McNulty and I'm the founder of 1M4. So 1M4 stands for One Million Madly Motivated Moms. And what we are is a coalition of black mothers who have decided to uh, that we're going to work to end police violence by the year 2038. And we do that through our influence, for, through our intellect and by protecting our own mental health, which is our greatest weapon in this fight. So I am glad to be here. Well, I am excited to have you. I think your organization is different. I've never, when I always saw you on uh, Instagram, I was like, what is 1M4? What is that? So I'm glad that I got to know you over this time frame and just knowing what you're passionate about. You are a mother of two boys, I believe. That's right. And the fact that you got other mothers involved um, in this fight to say, you know, we're tired and we're going to take care of our children. I love it. Um, so thank you for being here. And Dr. Jacobs, um, over the last couple of years since COVID began, mental health has become more of a concern and a topic that is being brought up more readily in the black community, which is great and not so great because of the amount of suicidal threats, right? Um, and attempts and follow through um, that we are seeing and hearing about. Can you speak speak more to this? Yes, most certainly. Uh, so, so even prior to the pandemic, uh, we there was a, uh, a study that was done that showed that uh, black youth uh, are committing suicide twice the, twice, at twice the rate as white youth. And when I saw that, I had to read it more than once because I, I couldn't believe it. Um, that's how shocked I was um, hearing that and seeing that, that statistic. And so, um, and then obviously with the pandemic, the pandemic has only exacerbated uh, you know, mental health and the need for services and support. And so, One of the things that we see a lot of times in the black community, especially, is, you know, some of those cultural norms. I think those cultural norms paralyze folks when it comes to seeking help. A lot of times within the black community, especially, uh, it's frowned upon to to seek outside help or support. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do is really get on the ground and try to, you know, and and trying to spread that mental health literacy. Uh, I think that's I think that's so important um, because. You know, our 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 our, our people are are dying at, at very high rates, and this pandemic is only going to exacerbate things. I mean, 
right now, you know, we've had the earthquake with the pandemic, and I feel like the tsunami is is is, is about to hit. Um, and because I think the residual effects from this pandemic is going to be from years to come. And so my hope, my prayer, my wish is that we continue to spread the awareness so that we're normalizing uh, mental health as, as much as possible, especially within uh, communities of color. Thank you. You brought up cultural norms. Let's talk about this a bit. Um, as most people know, I have a psychology background. Um, my bachelor's is in psychology and a communications um, AA. So I'm really big on just, you know, understanding cultural norms and just understanding behaviors of people in general. So when you talk about cultural norms in regards to mental health, what are those some of those cultural norms within the black community that stop us from getting the mental health uh, services that we need? I think it really what, what it is, is first off, recognizing what mental health is. So I think that education piece or lack thereof, I think that a lot of folks that they're struggling with, let's say depression, uh, they might have these, these symptoms, but they may not know that it's depression. Um, and then the second piece to that is from a cultural standpoint, you know, a lot of times it's, uh, you know, in the black community, a lot of people will go to their pastor or go to their church, deacon, somebody that, who they have a relationship with at their church before they go to like a professional when it comes to you know, dealing with their mental health or whatever it is that, that they're struggling with. Uh, and, there's, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes what happens is um, some of our, you know, our pastors in the community, some, for some of them, they may not know where to direct people to. Um, and so I think it's very important that, you know, people understand that, you know, it's okay to not be okay, that we're all struggling with some level of mental health. Um, and if we aren't, uh, we, we will. Uh, and so it's just, it's so important. I mean, it, it, it is vital that we get that support uh, and we feel um, comfortable in doing so. And so I think that the second piece to that too is the way uh, mental health, the way like therapy is um, portrayed like on television. At times, you know, you, you see uh, like, like a middle-class white woman when, when a therapist is like on TV, you know, doing therapy. Uh, you might see like a middle class white woman, and so it's not always relatable. Uh, and then there's also this notion that therapy is very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that only like white people do, and so that's something that I'm trying to change, trying to change that narrative, and and really trying to, to demystify what therapy is yeah. um, and, and what support is. So I think that you know there's a couple of things that we're, we're sort of we're up against, and. I think those those cultural norms they run extremely deep, and so I think that you know the more we're able to to uh, to educate and folks and, and to bring more awareness, and especially from people like like myself who's you know who's, who's black and uh, you know the laws of attraction and the, and, the, and the significance of that, I think that that will you know put people in a greater position uh, and allow people to feel more comfortable about you know seeking that help. Absolutely, you brought up exactly what I wanted you to bring up: religion. <laughs> We can't talk about uh, black anything without talking about our background in religion, right? Uh, sometimes our religious beliefs, um, ideologies, and uh, worldviews can stop us from getting the help that we need because it's been so culturally in, ingrained in our minds that we just go to our pastor and he'll pray for us or he'll tell us to pray, right? And so mental health is just one of those things where it's, like you said, we see it from a, a media standpoint of laying on someone's couch. And like you said, it's usually a, a, a middle class white woman or something of that nature. And we don't see ourselves in those narratives. Now we're starting to see more black people talk about mental health, people like yourself, people like Tansy McNulty, starting to bring up mental health in the black communities, which is so um abnormal for us, right, that we're still having a lot of pushback from a lot of community members. Just to give you uh, a little a little story, I recently told a person that I know that, hey, you might want to, um, you know, think about seeking some therapy for, you know, some things that you were, you were going through. And this person said, therapy is a waste of money. I can talk to myself. I can figure myself out. I can, you know, um, I can read books. I can do all the things that they've done. Um, and all they're going to do is give me opinions and advice. What would you say to that, uh, Dr. Sheldon? You know, I would say this. So, so, so first off, I would say, and thank you for that, uh, but I would say that, you know, therapy is not something that I uh, recommend for everybody. Um, I think that there's somebody that you, in, in, in your family, a friend that you, or somebody that you can maybe go to for, Talk about certain things. I think I think that's great. Um, one thing about therapy is it's very personal. It's very um, intimate. Uh, you know, it can be very unco uncomfortable. And so I think that for a lot of people, that that that, that creates a lot of fear, creates a lot of uh, anxiety. And so I think that um, you know, you know yourself. If you're at a point where you're functioning is being impacted because you're not getting the, the support or the help you need, then that's when it's time to to, to seek a professional. Uh, however, if it's something that like, like an adjustment issue or maybe going through a divorce, 
um, maybe you have somebody in your corner that you can go to for support. I think that that that's that's everything. Um, but the stigma is real. You know, the stigma is what really you know prevents many people from getting that help and the support. So I think that the more we're able to uh, sort of chip away, chip away at that stigma that is this, uh, I think more people will feel more comfortable uh, about getting that support. But again, it comes with education. It comes with spreading spreading awareness. Thank you for that. And what would you say, Tansy, to jump into this conversation with us as a as a motivated mom, a madly motivated mom? <laughs> how would you um, how would you describe the cultural norms around mental health in our in our uh, community? So I would. So I'm glad you touched on um, religion um, because I, I do think it. We get hesitant because we think oh, I just can pray better. I just get someone to lay hands on me. Which those are effective measures. Don't get me wrong. I believe in the power of prayer, but I also believe that um, I'm a Christian. So, so God trained certain people or put certain skills or enabled them to get the education they need to help guide us through this. So I believe in working and praying, right? So putting forth the work, scheduling time with a therapist. I, I'm with my therapist every two weeks. I tried to pull that out to three uh, to three weeks or four weeks at one point. No, 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 no. I have to be there every two weeks, like clock, clockwork, because I work in heavy work. I'm a black woman. So I'm in social justice work, so I see a lot of death, I see a lot of trauma. But even if I wasn't in that work, I would still see it because I have children. I have loved ones who are black right. and marginalized. We're carrying a lot of weight. We had we have the pandemic that we're still in. We still we still have COVID nineteen. It's still there. Still there. We have that. We have the other pandemic that's been going on, or I guess we should call it an epidemic. I don't know. Yeah. Racial <laughs> racial issues that are going on in this country. We carry this every single day. So we need an outlet, someone who is not who's not our our friend, who can help us kind of wade through the emotions, wade through the um, the the feelings, the emotions, the trauma to really just kind of help us work through it. And I believe that God put people here who are trained to do that. There, some of them, some were born with it and they develop it in education. Others were just trained in the space. Trust them to guide you. So, um, so for someone so they can talk to themselves, um, if you talk to yourself, you're probably gonna get the same response that you're already thinking because it's you. <laughs> right. I mean, you're not referencing anybody. Right. But, but I suggest that you get guided through it with a professional. Thank you for that, Tansy. And you're absolutely right. We're already in a, we've been in an epidemic for 400 years, right? Oh, <laughs> a racial epidemic. Um, recently, Governor Sisolak in August of 2020 um, uh, proclaimed and put it on record that racism is a public health issue. We were happy to see that in public health. Um, there's so many states that are coming um, around with this with this now. A lot of about 20 states so far that I've researched have declared this and are working towards it for a governor to come out for an, a, to, a whole total you know uh, state to say we are going to fix this problem. We're going to work on this problem. First of all, to even acknowledge it is really huge um, and that it is a public health issue that racism is a public health issue is huge because now we get to talk about mental health. Now we get to talk about the things that um, that inter intersect with racism, right? And all the things that we suffer f through and from. Um, so that was really important. And I want everyone to know that that is something that has happened in the state of Nevada in August of 2020, so that you all can reference that um, in your work that you do, or just in general for the general public to know that this is an issue that the state is really um, trying to work on. And so I appreciate you you all being here and being so open to talk about mental health because, like you said, Dr. Sheldon, sometimes the stigma alone um, can shame us, right? People like to shame us with certain things that they don't believe in or that they don't agree with. So the fact that you are all are so open to talk about this issue um, is really extremely important to me. So I really appreciate you being here for that. And then just as in regards to uh, religion and spirituality, I want people to understand that there's a certain level of education that a therapist must have that is different than a religious pastor um, or different training than what a religious pastor would go through. Dr. Sheldon, can you speak more on that? What type of training is needed for a mental health therapist? Yeah, certainly. Uh, a lot of education and training. Uh, so uh, <laughs> to start the education piece, uh, so most clinicians either have at the, at the least a, a, a master's degree. Some also have a doctorate degree, but at the, at the least, um, you know, many therapists have a master's degree. And on top of that master's degree, there's uh, thousands of hours of training. So, uh, so most clinicians have to undergo 3,000 hours of clinical supervision. So it's you know doing counseling um, with, with clients, it's uh, groups, uh, uh, family counseling, couples counseling, individual counseling. Uh, it's pretty extensive. And then on top of all of that, you have to take a test. <laughs> 
and and for depending on the state, whatever state you live in, some that test can be a, it could be a two part test, uh, but the test is not easy. Um, so there's a lot, it's a lot involved. Uh, it's not an easy journey, um, and so uh, for for any clinician to get to that point, uh, you know, usually means that they're pretty, um, you know, pretty well trained. There's still obviously things that they pick up as time goes on with experiences, like in any profession, but. But yes, there's a lot of education and a lot of training that, that's involved. It sounds like it. Um, and that's just what I wanted to highlight to people out there when they say, um, I don't believe in therapy or it's just talk, like talking to your friend or something of that nature. And it's a little bit different because, like you said, there's thousands of hours that have gone into someone's education to be able to give them um, accurate feedback or in this person's opinion that I spoke of earlier um, just to give accurate opinions <laughs> right and advice um, and so I just really wanted to highlight that there's a lot of education that goes into someone that um, practices uh, uh, mental health and therapy in the mental health area this is not just something that um, is your friend talking to you this is a uh, a professional who has the education in the background and not to take away from pastors at all, because I know that they have their education in their background as well in theology. Right. Um, but we want people to know that there is a difference in the different um, education um, topics that they go through as they go through their training. Um, so as we move forward, I wanted to ask Tansy, how did you connect your business um, um madly motivated moms with mental health. Did you always know that you wanted to cover mental health within your business? I did not. So um, as being a business owner, your business pivots and grows in, in a lot of different directions, right? So I knew starting out, uh, my focus is I'm, I'm committed to ending police violence by the year 2038, full stop. But as I do this work and I'm asking other moms to come along with me, hey, we can do this together, I start noticing, oh, they're stressed. Oh, they're traumatized. Oh, I'm asking them to call this this legislator or call somebody, but they're mourning. Mm. So there are other things that, that we're carrying that I have to I have to address. I can't ignore it because it shows up in the work. Right. Um, shows up in the work often. So um, so pretty soon after we launched, we started doing these. We call them sister check ins, and they're exactly what how they're described. They're check ins with sisters, and all we do we sit there. It's a vir in a virtual setting. Hopefully one day it'll be in person <laughs> in a virtual setting, and we talk about different topics topics that are impacting us on a daily basis. So um, we cover it. We've talked to police. Well, my brother's a police officer, which is interesting for my mom. An activist on one side. Right. <laughs> so bless her heart. But um, we had my brother come on as a police officer, talk to him from his perspective. We've talked to public defenders. We've talked to prosecutors. But we also, I brought in my life coach. So you can, like, I'm doing this this work with help. Like, I'm, I have my therapist. I have my life coach. We also do yoga. We have a breathing, a, bre breath, a breath work session coming up soon, too. Like, there are, there are things that we have to address outside of social justice so that we can sustain. Absolutely. If your mind is jacked or you're, you're having heaviness that you're carrying, you cannot sustain in this work because it's, it's added pressure every day, added pressure every day, added pressure every day. You have to release it or, you're gonna, or, or your body's going to shut you down. That's just how it shows up. So I had to bring in the mental health component. So if, if people who have known me coming from the beginning, they're like, your bio's kind of changed. Now you have this whole mental health thing. Like, I have to. <laughs> right. Or I would not have a sustainable organization. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the power is powered by black women. It's powered by black, black, black moms and mother figures. In order to empower them, they have to be healthy and whole so they can do the work. So, yeah, it, it kind of changed. <laughs> mental health <laughs> came on board about two years ago. Like, as we were going into the pandemic, I guess, I don't know, divinely, I was already in the space to, be, right. to, to, to meet with people virtually. And then la the last two years has been pushing, normalizing mental health, letting people know that the same way you might have a heart health issue, your heart's in your body, mm -hmm. your mind is in your body too. These are not two separate things. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't, if I broke my leg, I'm not going to my friend and say, hey friend, what should I do about my leg? They don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm going to go to a professional. Right. I'm going to call up Dr. Dr. Sheldon. Hey, can you help me? Like I, I just had, I, I, I had severe um, post postpartum anxiety after my second son. Okay. Like I'm gonna go to somebody who can help walk walk me through these things. Okay. Because they're trained in it. Yeah. They're professional. Like we have to be, we have to be smart and treat our mind like we do the rest of our body. It's all one unit. And I appreciate you saying that, that your body um, will shut down on you if you don't take care of yourself. Um, in the spirit of trans. Um, transparency. I'm I'm super transparent for all the people that know me out there. Um, I actually went through like some self care stuff this weekend. I said on um, Friday I just shut down my email. I I was just at this point where I was just like, you know what? No more emails. I'm tired. I'm mm -hmm. I'm exhausted. 
Um, I actually went to the hospital Thursday night um, and I was told that I was dehydrated and exhausted. And I was just like, I'm exhausted. <laughs> and the doctor had to tell me that. He was just like, I can't find anything else wrong with you besides the fact that you're dehydrated, which means, you know, other things, which is exhaustion and things of that nature come from that. Um, and so Friday, I just decided to shut it all down. Just shut my email down. I put a nice little um, note, out of office note. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I will be back on Tuesday at and 9 a.m. And that's fair. <laughs> and I just got an email back this morning from um, some people that I work with at the, at the Department of Family Services. And someone replied back to my my auto office and said, I absolutely love your auto office message. I wish I could be this transparent at my job and tell them I'm exhausted. <laughs> And I said, you know what? I really appreciate that. I was like, I was just being transparent. I just had to shut it down for the day. So I was trying to put something out there really quick. But it really, what that told me was there are so many other people who are exhausted. So let's talk about that. As you work in this field, Dr. Sheldon, how do you take care of yourself? What's your self-care regimen? Great question. Uh, and I, I heard something recently about uh, self-care is a new health care. And mm -hmm. so our self-care is, is so important. And I think what's, what's most important about our self-care is being proactive. I think a lot of times we, t we tend to wait to utilize our, our self-care, you know, or our coping tools, whatever you want to call it, when the roof is coming off the house mm -hmm. um, versus being proactive. Um, and so I, I equate, you know, our coping tools with uh, vitamins. It's like vitamins. We take our vitamins to build our immunity, right? Um, so same thing with our coping tools. If we practically use our coping tools, we're going to build immunity for our, our, our mental wellness. So that when stressors come, you know, coming come into our lives, we're able to more effectively deal with them versus when we're not in that mentally well place yes. and the stressor comes, it, it's going to really have a, a great impact on us. So it's very important that we are utilizing our coping tools, being proactive, but finding the ones that work for us. Um, mm -hmm. Because something that might work for me may not work for you guys, right? And my wife and I, we joke about this all the time because I'm a, a, a gym guru. And so obviously during the pandemic, you know, the gym shut down. Yeah. So I, you know, so I had to find some other ways to go about getting my exercise in. Whereas my wife, she hates the gym. I mean, she has an allergy to the gym. We and have so, the same <laughs> allergy. <laughs> we have the same allergy. <laughs> so for her, you know, so, so for her, other things work like yoga and meditation. That, that's like her, you know, her, her space. That's what works for her. For, whereas for me, it doesn't have the same effect. So I think it's what's important is finding the, the tools that work best for you uh, so that you are acti actively applying that, that, that self-care. But it's also about being open, right? A lot of people in our black community, um, because of religion, we've been told that yoga is bad, that yoga has a, a connotation, you know, another spiritual connotation to it that's not what we subscribe to, right? So it's even about researching things, right? Um, and finding, like you said, find the tools that work for you, but we have to also be open, <laughs> to finding those tools and being able to do our own research and say, you know, maybe yoga to me is just stretching. It, I don't have to do the yom and all that stuff. <laughs> um, but I hear a lot of things. I hear a lot of barriers to um, mental health practices within our community. I tell people all the time, like, I, go, I do yoga. You do yoga and go to church? And, you know, so we have to talk about these things, right? Um, because yoga might actually help somebody, but because they're in the mindset of that it's going to affect their religion in some type of way, then we stop you know, we stop doing the things that we need to do for ourselves to find out, can I do this? And is God in line with this that I'm working on? Right. Absolutely. And one, one, of, the, one of the great things, and again, it's become my mission to really get the awareness out there and go into churches and go into, into the community. And so April 13th, you know, I'm putting on a large uh, uh, wellness fair um, that's going to be you know, put on by many different providers, vendors that, that are of color um, so that people can kind of see you know, what this looks like. Um, so, for instance, uh, we're talking about yoga. So, I'm gonna have s several folks doing yoga, doing you know um, some, some various meditative uh, practices, um, and so that's gonna be great. I think a lot of times when it comes to, like yoga, you know, when you see it portrayed in, in, in various uh, venues or settings like television, uh, you know, it's, it's usually done by you know it, it looks a certain way, right. and it, it looks a way that maybe that our people can't identify with. Right. So I want to, you know, I want, I want, I want our people to identify what these different levels of, uh, of, of support services, uh, self care, you know, techniques, uh, because I think that that is very important. Cause like I said, the laws of attraction, you know, carry a lot of weight. 
So you said April 13th, you were putting on a community health fair. Can you Correct. give us more information? Yes. April 13th, uh, it's going to be held at the Pearson Center from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Mm-hmm. Completely free. Uh, it's going to be games for, for children, free food, uh, free everything, music, live, de- uh, uh, live DJ. Uh, so please come on, come on out and uh, get connected to services and, and various supports. And will NAMI be there as well? Yes, is NAMI will be there as well, along with with a number of other uh, uh, providers from you know from the from the medical space, uh, from obviously mental health, and also for, from the spiritual health communities. And I will work on getting a COVID nineteen um, pop up clinic there as well, so that we can make sure that we're still talking about this pandemic because I don't want anyone to think for one moment just because that we're taking off our masks that the pandemic is over. There is still a virus <laughs> that is circulating through our world. And then, Tansy, I just want to talk to you really quick about the resource guide that you put together. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. Thank you. So um, one in four in December of 2020, we had a conversation. We usually do our end of year like assessment. Right. So we look, what are we going to do in 2021? So in December 2020, we said, well, what do we you know, we want to move people away from a law enforcement response. Like, what do we know? Like, we know for a fact that. 25% 25% of police violence deaths involve those who are having a mental health emergency. My organization got together. We found our first 35 mobile crisis units across the country. We split up. I, I drafted up a quick script, split up with, between the women. Let's call these places. So we called them. And at the end of every conversation, we said, well, who do you work with in this space? Who else do you work with in another state or even in your state that can say that they do this similar type of work? Did that. So we have now compiled over 150 mobile crisis units across the country. So you go on, uh, on our, it's a, it's a free resource guide on our website that's available to anybody. So if you have a loved one who has um, mental health emergencies that, that arise or are triggered by something, or if you're just out and about and you see someone who looks like they may, may, they may need help, this gives you an outlet to not have to always call 911. If it's not a truly criminal behavior, which having a mental, mental break, a psychotic break, does not mean that they're criminal. Right. They need help. They can call these numbers, and there are people who will come out that are, that are certified and, and who can help you. Can you tell people where to find that resource guide? Absolutely. It can be found at www.1m4.org. This next resource, 211. 211 is a, is a great resource. It's, it's always um, being updated. Uh, you, can text, you can text it. You can go online. Uh, you can call 211, um, and you will get a myriad of, of uh, uh, providers and resources and supports. Perfect. Tansy, do you have any others? Um, so a, a resource that, that I had to use when I was looking for my own therapist was, for me, it was www.therapyforblackgirls.com. I used that, and I actually um, recommend it to, to the other black women in my community. But um, coming this summer will be another additional resource that will be 988. So 988 will hopefully one day replace even our mobile crisis guide, right? Um, Dr. Sheldon, if you want to leave us with your handles or where they can purchase your book, because you didn't talk about your book, <laughs> go right ahead. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, so my book uh, is titled 48, an experiential memoir on homelessness. Uh, you can find it uh, online, uh, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon. Uh, you can also go to my website, uh, Um and I can sign it for you um, from there. And then uh, also my handles, uh, Dr. Jacobs33, uh, IG, uh, Twitter, and uh, Facebook is Sheldon Jacobs. Perfect. And you, Tansy? Sure. So our, uh, our website, www.1m4.org, and you can get more information about the organization there. Um, all of our, our handles on Instagram, Twitter, um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, it's We Are 1M4. Now we're going to talk about our Arm in Arm Against COVID um, uh, campaign. Arm in Arm is a collaboration formed by local agencies, Brain Trust, uh, some, uh, some New Marketing, and Erica at Villas Consulting in partnership with the Southern Nevada Health District. The initiative is our community's chance to come together to share information, community resources, and have enlightened discussions, Arm in Arm to protect ourselves and our community against COVID-19. This month's Arm in Arm updates include, as of February 10th, Governor Sisolak has taken the mask mandate off of Nevada, However, this does not mean that COVID and all of its variants are gone or that we have even reached endemic levels yet. Um, As far as vaccinations, they are still readily available at the Southern Nevada Health District pop-up clinics around town through Immunize Nevada pop-up clinics, Walgreens, and other pharmacy locations. You can check their websites to see where they will be. And I just want to thank the Southern Nevada Health District for putting this radio program together for the black community. Um, so that we can be more informed about what public health is. 
So thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning for the Just the Facts and a special thank you to our guests once again. 